You get around someone who's thankful, it encourages you, doesn't it? Boy, boy, thank you for doing that. Thank the Lord for this. Thank you for having this. Thank you for doing this. Boy, you start to feel warm and bubbly on the inside. But you get around someone who's complaining, who's got a bad attitude, who's got a sour disposition, who just seems to find fault with everything, it's kind of toxic, isn't it? You see that number come up on your cell phone, and what do you say to yourself? Uh, uh, am I doing anything else? Anything, possibly. Do you say, well, thank the Lord for caller ID. I'll call them back. You get around someone who's ungrateful and it's, it's toxic. We see in the Bible the children of Israel had a problem with complaining. Every time it turned around, it didn't seem to matter what God did. They found a reason to find fault with it. Whatever God did, it wasn't quite good enough. No matter what he provided, no matter what he worked out, no matter what he did, they always wanted something a little bit different. You've been around someone like that before? No matter what you do, it's not quite good enough enough. I've noticed this years ago with our teenagers. Now, our teenagers now are doing a phenomenal job, and uh, we've got a teen revival scheduled this week, and I'm looking forward to what God will do, and they had a prayer meeting last week before the church revival, and they are growing. But years ago, I was a principal at the school, and someone, uh, I think it was Pastor Scott, said, we've got this leftover pancake mix. Do you want to use it to have a pancake breakfast at school? And I'm an idea guy. I like vision. I'm like, this will be cool. We'll cancel classes. All oh, the teachers will make pancakes. I mean, what's better than going to school than not having classes and eating breakfast instead of school? One of the teachers said, listen, I'll bring chocolate chips, and we'll make little designs in the pancakes. I'm like, this is like the best news all day long. Like, I'm excited on the inside and on the outside. So I'm going class to class, announcing that, listen, tomorrow, I'm sick and tired of this thing. You know, of course, now students are like, you know, I'm sick and tired, and we're not having school tomorrow. We're going to come, come here and have pancakes for breakfast. Of course, the teachers are like, yeah, or the students are like, yeah, this is great, until I got to this one class. So we're not having school tomorrow, repeating my little routine I'd worked up, right? Not having school, we're having pancakes. And one smart aleck, one ungrateful wretch of a human being, teenager, says, what? No sausage. You ever, inside you, get that feeling? <laughs> Makes you go from zero to a hundred, sure. like that, faster than any motorcycle? You ever get that feeling? Anybody, or is it just me occasionally? And what? No sausage. I had to push it back down my spirit. I'm like, what? No sausage? No sausage for you, and no pancakes, no more life for you, all right? You're out of here. <laughs> Ungratefulness. Now, I don't, I, I, listen, that teenager... Whatever. God bless them. We all have that inside of us. We can laugh at that, but we all have that inside of us. A spirit of ingratitude. A spirit of complaining. Oh, what? You're only going to do this and not this? Lord, you only did this and I didn't get this blessing? Oh, what? No sausage. When we come to Psalm 100, we see a psalm of thanksgiving. I am told it was often and still often used in worship for thanksgiving. If you have your Bibles, look please in Psalm 100 where the Bible says this, familiar psalm, make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have. Lord, I ask that you would help us to see your goodness, your mercy, and your truth. Lord, may we, during this time, 
have a particularly special time of thanksgiving. May our hearts be turned toward you. And Lord, no matter what you bring across our path, no matter what you allow in our life, whether we perceive it to be good or whether we perceive it to be hard, Lord, may we have a spirit of thankfulness and praise towards you. Lord, bless this time in particular, please, as I speak. May my words be clear, but may your words and your spirit and your truth be powerful. Lord, I pray you touch hearts today, and if someone's here who doesn't know you as their Savior, that they would trust you today and believe on you. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. The story is told about two men who were walking in a field. As they walked in this field, they came across a bull. The bull did not like them in his territory. He instantly became enraged and began to chase, as the story goes, these two men. They began to run toward the fence, but they perceived very quickly that they would not make the fence before the bull came upon them. As this little story goes, the one man said to the other, John, listen, you've got to pray for us. And as they're running, the other man, John, says, listen, I can't. I've never prayed publicly, publicly before. I'm not comfortable. The other man said, you've got to, John. You've got to pray for us. This bull's about to get us. And so he said, listen, I only know one prayer. My father taught it to me, and it went like this. Lord, help us to be thankful for what we're about to receive. <laughs> Spirit of thankfulness. Sometimes the Psalms, throughout the entire 150 Psalms, are filled with turmoil. Sometimes reject. Sometimes questions. Sometimes hurt. But Psalm 100 is a cloudless, sunlight-filled psalm. It is a psalm of praise, a psalm of direction, a psalm that praises God. This morning, I want us to look at Psalm 100 in the light of what we thank God for, or three reasons for thankfulness. We often are thankful for what God has done for us. That is not a bad reason. We can find that throughout the book of Psalms. Lord, you've done this. Lord, you've worked this way. Lord, you brought this. And often, if we were to be honest, to look at our lives and our spirit of thankfulness toward God, it is often in relation to what he has done, brought, and accomplished. Needs he has met. Bills that have been paid. Sicknesses that he has healed. Things like that. We're thankful. And we ought to be thankful for those things. But sometimes... Sometimes we ought to turn our thankfulness to who God is, not just what he does. There's a restaurant in California. On this menu, each of the items are self-help items. One item is mentioned, I am gorgeous. I am terrific. I am magnificent. They're menu items at a California-based organic restaurant that serves up a healthy portion of good food, they say, and good thoughts. Read about that restaurant. I have no desire to go there. <laughs> For a couple of reasons. One meal is a macro macrobiotic sea vegetables topped top with a satisfying spicy house-made kimchi. That dish is called I Am Whole. I'd rename that dish I Am Sick. <laughs> <laughs> the point of this restaurant is that you need self-affirmations and they give you gratitude-stimulating prompts. And while I can kind of tease about the restaurant, I want to this morning give you some gra gratitude-stimulating thoughts from God's Word. Not with kimchi or lentils, but with some truth from God's Word. You see, we come to Psalm 100, a familiar psalm, but it teaches us to be thankful for who God is. You see, there's a central theme in Psalm 100, and the theme is the Lord. We see it that, first of all, the Lord is central because He created us. 
We are His creation. We are not ourselves. Don't ever miss the fact that we are created. It is not by accident that we are here, but God Himself all right, formed us. He created us. He made us. The reason we can praise Him is because He is the creator of all of life. God is the creator. But beyond that, we're His choice. We are His people. Not only did God create us, he wanted us. He wanted us. Why would he want someone like me? Oh, we think we got some good things to offer God. Lord, I got some pretty good talent. Lord, I'm pretty handy with my hands. Lord, I'm pretty smart. But the fact is, we are nothing. There's a central theme about God in this psalm. We were created, we're his choice. But in our response, there's a response of consecration where the psalm says, serve the Lord with gladness because of his creation that is you and I because of his choice. We ought to be consecrated to him. You see, there's a central theme and the right response is to God. But there's also some clear commands. In these verses, there are six different commands that the writer gives to us. Make a joyful noise. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. I'll pause there real quick. That's partly why we sing at church. You ought to sing at church. You ought to make a joyful noise to the Lord. And for some people, it is noise. (laughs) But make a joyful one. Joyful one. He says, come in the presence with singing. Know, know ye. That the Lord, he is God. Know the God you follow. Enter into his courts with praise and the worship of him and be thankful. Six commands. There are clear commands in this psalm. Some reactions that we ought to have because of our God. There's clear commands. I was reading this morning in the book of Jeremiah where God brings the thought that he desires obedience to him. God desires that I follow him. And here in Psalm 100, I can clearly see some reactions I ought to have to God. I ought to make a joyful noise. I ought to serve him with gladness. It is not a hard service. It is a wonderful service. It is a good thing to serve God. It is great to come into his presence with singing. It is a blessing. It is a blessing to know the God that I follow. I can know the Lord that he is God. What a blessing. But there's some clear commands. But we're coming to three reasons for thankfulness today. If I can draw your attention to the last verse of Psalm 100. Right before, in verse number 4, we're commanded to enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, and be thankful, and bless his name. And verse 5 leads off with a thought, for... He just commanded us to enter into his course with thanksgiving and be thankful unto him. And now he's going to teach us the reasons. He's going to give us the scenario, the certainty for which thankfulness ought to be there to God. There are three, there are three reasons to be thankful this morning from Psalm 100. Three reasons that we can rejoice in the God we serve. Would you look at verse number five? For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Let me give you three considerations for thankfulness this morning. The first one is this. God's goodness. God's goodness is unmeasured. God's goodness is unmeasured. For the Lord is good. So I mentioned that Brother Brady's song fit right in where we're going this morning. God's good. Often you'll, when another Christian say God is good, and you'll hear this return phrase, all the what? All the time. But I fear that sometimes that's a nice little cliche, but we don't really mean it. Oh, he's good sometimes. He's good when I perceive him to be good. He's good when my life is going pretty smooth and and when there's no problems, no hiccups. He's pretty good when everything goes the way that I want it to go. God is good 
I'm on top of the mountain. God is good. Boy, I've got this amount of money in my bank account. Boy, and i got everything planned out. There's no problems at my house. There's no problems in my marriage. There's no problems at church. There's no problems in my family. There's no problems at my job. God is good. And truly, he is good during those times, is he not? But then one day, get a flat tire. My dad and I were changing a flat tire one time on I-75. My dad has always been the man to stop for those vehicles. Why? I have no idea. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> Finished changing this flat tire. We walked around the car. As a young person, I would be like, Dad, do we have to stop again? And again, I've changed more flat tires by the side of the road, all right, than AAA. <laughs> man. <laughs> Someone else can relate. Finished changing this flat tire, put the stuff back in the trunk, walked around the car, and immediately a car drove off the road and hit the back of the car that we had just changed, where we had just closed the trunk. Hit the back of the car and flipped into the median. Car was upside down. We ran over there and helped the man get out of the car. It's one of those days, like, can it get any worse? Man was okay, we're okay, lady was okay. Heart, not okay. <laughs> Lost a few. If I don't live as long in life, that's why. <laughs> that's why. Sometimes we feel like, boy, I had a flat tire, then my car gets hit in the back. Then we begin to wonder, and those thoughts begin to creep in. Well, God, what did I do wrong? God, you're not good today. Lord, it doesn't seem like you're good right now. Because... We relate his goodness just to what he does for us. But God is good no matter how we interpret it. No matter what we think about it, God is still good because the Lord is good. It is a truth. It is a fact. Take it to the bank. No matter what you perceive, God's good. And we ought to be thankful because of his goodness. In the good times, when everything is just clicking, when things are rolling, when everything is like, wow, it couldn't be any smoother, any better, and when it seems like the train has left the tracks and is in the ravine and is smashed to a thousand pieces and you're inside of it and it's on fire, <laughs> when it feels that way, still be thankful because God is still good. And his goodness is un measured. We try to measure it. Well, if this bill is paid, well, then you're really good. And if you even pay more than the bill, then you're whoa over the top good. No, his goodness is unmeasured because he is the definition of goodness. Your life and my life, God is good. You know, sometimes my kids don't think I'm a good father when I'm trying to do good things for them. I make them go to bed They don't perceive that to be good. You know what they perceive to be good? Staying up all night. I don't know about your kids, but my kids have a nasty habit. They remember everything after we pray and say time to go to bed. Everything. Oh, Dad, Mom, I forgot that I have to fill in the blank. Build this entire school project. It'll take 15 hours we can do it right now. Oh, Dad, I had a question for you. Oh, I have to brush my teeth. I need another drink of water. i got to lay out this. Oh, I can't find my soccer stuff. I can't find this. Okay, kids, go to bed now. <laughs> Why do I want to go to bed? Well, one, for peace, of, peace and quiet for my wife and I, right? But also, yeah, thank you, Mr. Redway. Yes, amen. But also because sleep's good for them. Yeah. All right, kids who don't ever sleep and they're cranky, all right, a whole lot worse. They don't always perceive that to be good. Boy, parents are just putting us in bed. You better believe it, I am. And sometimes what God is doing, we don't perceive to be good. But God is growing us. He's forming us to be just like his son, Jesus Christ. God is good. We can thank God because his goodness is unmeasured. As a faithful missionary... His name was Alan Gardner. He experienced many physical difficulties and hardships throughout his 
service to the Savior. Yet despite all his troubles, he said this, while God gives me strength, failure will not daunt me. At the age of 57, a young man, he died of disease and starvation while serving on some islands in the southern tip of South America. When they found his body, his diary lay near, and it bore the record of hunger, thirst, loneliness, and wounds. But what caught their attention was the very last entry in his diary. Before he passed, missionary Alan Gardner wrote this, I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. If someone found the, di the diary of your heart, what would they read? Would they read, Today I hurt. Today I thirst. Today I'm lonely. But I'm overwhelmed with the goodness of God. We ought to be thankful because the Lord is good. But the verse goes on, doesn't it? Boy, we could stop right there, but the verse doesn't stop there. It says not only that the Lord is good, but it, begin, it continues to say this, that His mercy is everlasting. Not only is His goodness unmeasurable, His mercy is unending. Aren't you thankful for the mercy of God? I don't get what I always deserve because of God's mercy. That means I don't always reap the full consequences of all my bad choices. And we make bad choices every day. Oh, there's a little bad choices like you choose the wrong line at Walmart. I have a knack for that. There can be 15 lines and only one is shorter, and that's the particular person who has 15 returns, six bottle things to go and can't find their money. They left it in their vehicle, which is four miles away, and they have to walk there. That's the line I pick. Oh, I'm not talking about those bad choices. I'm thankful for the mercy of God in my life. I don't have to spend a day in hell. I get to spend eternity with Jesus because he died on the cross, and I trusted Jesus as my Savior. The Bible says this. David said, I am in a great strait. Let us, not, let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. Nehemiah says, Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness. Psalm verse 40, Withhold not thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Lamentations chapter number 3, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. And Paul in Corinthians says this, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. I was principal for 12 years, Bridgeport Baptist Academy. I figured something out very early on. Students in trouble want mercy. It was not a foreign thought because J.D. Howell wants mercy. If the police officer pulls you over, you don't say typically, that's it, I was guilty, write me up. Throw the book at me, sir, I deserve it. I was going six over. We don't say that, do we? Well, officer, you understand something. I was in a hurry. I was in a hurry. Well, why were you going 30 miles an hour over? 30 over? Was it 30? Didn't seem like it. I, I thought the speed limit was 105. <laughs> That's weird. That's so odd. Mercy. And I can be thankful. I can be grateful because God's mercy is unending. Now, don't mistake his patience for not caring. God cares what we do and how we act. God does chasten his children as we make wrong choices. But understand that God's mercy is compassionate. They fail not, and his mercy is unending. So thankful for the tender mercy of God that never runs out. If it's a battery for your car, there's the day you go and it just click, click, click. If it's the gas tank, one day it's empty, but God's mercy never has the power that it needs, never runs out of gas. His mercy sustained me. His compassion does not fail me. His everlasting care and concern and his pity for his children, his mercies are unending. 
How long is he God of mercy? The Bible says everlasting. How long will he pity his children? The Bible says everlasting. How long will he care for the sheep in his pasture? The Bible says everlasting. How long will he delight in doing good things? The Bible says everlasting. How long can we expect compassion? The Bible says everlasting. I'm thankful for the stunning reality of the mercy of God. We live in a world where everything is in decay. Everything tends toward decay. But God's mercies never grow old. They never run out. They're never ill-timed, and they never dry up. They never grow weak. They never get weary. They never fail to meet my need. They never disappoint, and they never, ever fail because they're new every single morning, fitted for the challenges of the day for the disappointments I may face, for the sufferings that I may feel, for the temptations that I may struggle through, within and without, I find the mercies of God. Mobsters are notoriously ruthless. Murder, thieving, baseball bats, cement galoshes, mobsters. Most, if not all, have heard the name before, Al Capone. A mobster born in, or I believe it was 1899, lived in that little town called Chicago. And one of the most notorious mobsters found in Chicago. I'm told that my grandmother lived down the street from Al Capone. She was, did not work for Al Capone. Vicious, ruthless, wicked. No one thinks of Al Capone as a great man. He's a mobster. Valentine's Day Massacre. Blame Al Capone for it, though he was conveniently in Florida at the time. Went to prison in 1932 at the ripe age of 33. You see, what you've heard of Al Capone is, is most likely true, but he only, he only was a vicious mobster in leading that group, that, that mobster, for a little bit of time. If you were to go to his gravestone today, you'd find engraved on his gravestone these three words, Sweet Jesus Mercy. Makes one wonder, like I did, why he would have that on his gravestone. I wonder if maybe he felt badly for what he had done. If he did, it's too late at that point. But I found a story. I found a story. See, Al Capone served seven years at Alcatraz. And there's a story out there that there was a visiting pastor that came to Alcatraz. The story that's been documented says this visiting pastor preached, and Al Capone attended the service. As the story goes, when they asked if anyone needed prayer, Al Capone raised his hand for prayer. And the visiting pastor said, does anyone need to accept Jesus as their Savior? And the story goes that Al Capone stood to his feet. Beyond that, we don't know if he trusted Christ that day. We do know that at the age of 40, in 1939, he was released from Alcatraz. Never went back to being a mobster, so I'm told. Never went back to Chicago, what I found. We know a few years later, on his tombstone, he's found sweet Jesus mercy. We know that Al Capone at one point in his life was a wicked man, a terrible man, an awful man, a vicious man, a ruthless man. But I'm here to tell you that no matter how vicious, no matter how ruthless, no matter how worthless we may think his life as a mobster was, if he came to Jesus, like the story leads us to believe, and he asked for mercy from Jesus, it was not failed to be given to him. Because anyone can come to Jesus. And his mercy is unending. Freely given, freely offered, and freely received. 
And I hope today that if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, if you've never come to him for mercy from your sins, you will ask him today to save you. And I can here to promise you, my friend, that God will save you. See, his goodness is unmeasured. His mercy is unending. But lastly, the verse says, his truth is unchanging. His truth, the Bible says, endureth to all generations. I can be thankful not only that my God is good and he's a good God, he defines goodness, he is goodness. I can be thankful to God because he is merciful and his mercies never end, they're everlasting. But I can be thankful to God because his truth never changes. His truth endures. His truth is unchanging. Truth today seems to be a moving target. The more we learn, the more truth changes. But God's truth never, ever changes. It seems that everyone is learning more truth. First they told us, don't eat eggs. Then they said, do eat eggs. Then they said, don't eat them. Now we're supposed to eat them again. Salt is good, salt is bad. Truth is changing, it seems, but God never changes. His promises are secure, and his proclamations are steadfast and sure. Rather than just thank God for what he's done, I could thank God for who he is, the God of truth. And Lord, what you say is true. It'll never change. When you tell me that you love me, that is true. When you tell me that you'll never leave me nor forsake me, Lord, that is true. Lord, when you tell me that you feel my infirmities, that is true. The truth of God is unchanging. There's a cathedral in Milan. There are three inscriptions that that span the splendid arches, they say. One inscription says this, All that pleases is but for a moment. Over over another arch, there are these words, all that troubles is but for a moment. But under the central arch is this inscription, that only is important, which is eternal. The truth of God is eternal. This season, November, hope you enjoy the holidays. Hope you enjoy Thanksgiving, enjoy the food, enjoy the time with family, enjoy the fluctuation in weather. I hope you're thankful. Hope you're thankful for what God has done. That's not bad, but would you not take some time to turn your heart to be thankful for who God is, his character. He is good. His mercy is unending, and his truth is unchanging. Have you thanked God For those three reasons? Or are you just consumed in what he does? Have you just defined his goodness on how you interpret it? Have you just been thankful for mercy when it's just been offered? And do you value his truth as unchanging? 